you're looking at the uh, valve train with the cams out of a rocker arm style head. Normally the cam is here, pushing down on the rocker. We're just gonna pull everything out of the way. First thing you do is pull all your shims out. Otherwise, when you flip that over, you're gonna lose all your shims and, not, and lose the order of where everything was. And these shims are, have different thicknesses that you change to change the adjustment on the valves? Correct, so valve lash or valve clearances. Um, if everything is installed correctly, then the only thing that controls how much that clearance or lash is, is the difference in the thickness of the shim. Most shims uh, are run in a, in a 0 0.05 increment. So you'd have like say a 2.00, which would be a two millimeter shim. The next one up would be a 2.05. Next one down would be a 1.95. Uh, 0.05 millimeters is equivalent to about two thousandths of an inch, whether you're working in standard or metric. Valve clearances down to, uh, generally there will be a certain spec that we want on the intake and the exhaust. Intake's usually a little tighter than the exhaust. And we're gonna be doing them down, you know, with the shims being that range, we can get them to within usually one to at the most two thousandths difference across the board which we're gonna to try to shoot for a specific range. The range will give you uh, you know, a tightest and a loosest, but we're gonna shoot for something very specific. Best case scenario is every clearance is gonna be the same uh, gap on the intake and the exhaust. Uh, we are doing the last disassembly part, which is stripping the head down, looking at the condition of the valves and the valve seats. and they're going to be tight. So what this tool is doing is pushing down, relieving the pressure of the retainer, which is what holds these springs in place. So I can take out these two little locking pieces, which are called cotters. <clears throat> yeah. And it's gonna give me a hard time. With those out of the way, we can pop the retainer out. So we can have access to the valve. That right there, those two little pieces, that's what keeps everything together. So the tragedy of valves is that we're gonna replace them all, no matter yes. what. No matter, uh, I don't care how good they look, but because this is a race application and it's an endurance motor, um, and even if this was a track day club racer guy at 4,000 miles, we're gonna push people to get valves because we don't know how much longer this thing is gonna be run after we build it. Two reasons, one, I don't want you coming back in six months saying, or ever, oh, we didn't put really. the, you didn't tell me I needed valves. Well, my goal is because you didn't want to pay for them. But because this is an endurance motor, this is the most fallible part in the motor. If this fails, you lose your whole motor. One of these heads break off, it goes jingle, jingle, jingle inside your cylinder, you lose your piston, you lose your cylinder, you lose your head. Because they generally will break at the highest RPM with the most load. Um, it's like throwing a giant quarter or a half dollar in your cylinder and causing all kinds of damage. Now if this engine was not a race application and for some inexplicable reason we had stripped the head, um, tell me why you're keeping the order of the springs and the valves um, organized with the cylinder head. Uh, for now, I just did it out of the way I disassemble engines, but the second I know I'm gonna replace it is they'll just get trashed. Um, but if this was a street guy with 4,000 miles, 4,000 miles is not a lot of miles on the street. I wanna keep everything in the same place because if, if everything goes well, I don't need to do a valve job or I don't need to do any other major work, all my shims are gonna be right back where they were. It actually saves me time down the road than hunting uh, to change all the values of the different parts. Separate is 
the retainers and the valve stem diameters are different from the intake and the exhaust. So even if we reuse any of these parts, I need to keep these cotters and these retainers separate from these and these, or else I'm going to be doing a lot more sorting. And that's all because the stem diameters are different between the intake and the exhaust, which is kind of common on a lot of the bikes now. So you have very specific parts on each side. So at a minimum, I'm gonna keep everything on the intake together and everything on the exhaust together. Okay, so these two are cleaned up, uh, but you can see the intake cleans up a lot easier than the exhaust because uh, what people don't realize is the heat difference when the motor is running. This is probably at a couple hundred degrees. This is gonna be upwards of 8,000 plus degrees um, because of all the burnt exhaust gases going past it. Um, so it bakes on the, the carbon and all the combustion gases and it. it's a lot harder to clean up. But we, what we're really primarily concerned with is this spot right here, which is the 45. That's what actually seals to the valve seat, which uh, as we saw when we did the leak down, we only had 4% leak down. When that is good, when that seal is good, that's the most important part. Uh, that's what's going to give us that, that really good <clears throat> leak down percentage, um, which means we have a good sealing engine. Uh, so these, this is the head stripped of all the valve train parts. Now we're just looking at basically a used uh, dirty combustion chamber. But you can see in here where the 45s are, that's where the, con the valve seat fate, uh, sits. The next step from here would be to thoroughly get all the carbon off the seats and then uh, do a really good inspection and look for any worst case cracks or anything in the valve seat but we didn't see any signs of that when we did the leak down or what we're really going to be looking for is any pitting which is normal either from a piece of dirt or something getting into the uh somehow getting past the air filter and getting sucked into the motor or uh just the carbon buildup and stuff and and just heat uh heat spots and stuff from uh, the bike running and so we'll recondition all the valve seats and if we really have to we'll do a complete valve job which would be a cutting of the surface to uh basically get past the worn or rough areas of the seat and get a fresh seat in there. Like it's already really, really good. Mm -hmm. This isn't 30 years ago when ports were not good and the valve seats weren't that, you know, like there, there's not really power in a valve, in a valve job anymore. It's more important getting the thing to have a good seat face. How do we feel about lapping compound and coatings on uh, titanium valves? We do not. Um, I, I do not lap regular valves anymore. You know, this is what lapping would be if I had a some sort of a abrasive compound. There you go. So, Tit modern titanium valves do not get lapped in the traditional way using a lapping compound. Lapping compound would be this, which is an abrasive, uh, this is an oil base, but an abrasive <clears throat> compound. The problem with that is, is you, when you do that, you lose a very specific coating that's on these valves, which makes them last. I could spend 10 seconds, lap that coating off. This valve might last a set of dyno runs. And eventually it'll just wear through and then it'll mushroom tip, which is it'll erode because we lost the protective layer, the boundary layer of the valve. It would suck itself in, lose valve clearance and be constantly held open. You'll lose all compression and running ability of the engine. What I'm doing is I took a Sharpie. <clears throat> this chamber has been quickly cleaned. I haven't even done a thorough cleaning yet. I just cleaned. I basically got all the carbon. Uh, out of this chamber, that's why it's shiny uh, compared to the way it came off the bike. And then uh, I take a Sharpie, I go around the whole seat area and the same with the valve. What this does is allow me to see the actual condition of the valve seat. If there's any pitting, uh, scoring marks or anything like that. Uh, some of it's from heat, some of it is from fuels, uh, pump gas, or regular, you know, regular gasolines. 
don't usually have too much of a problem, but when you start using really high-end fuels, especially with oxygen, it, uh, when you com it, it produces a lot of power, but it also has a lot of stuff in it. It's, it doesn't like titanium valves. The titanium valves will pit very fast. It'll also leave pit marks in the uh, valve seat area. But if you catch a spot, like right here, you can see a mark. It's really hard to see, but you'll see an indent. That's because that little dent or pot mark is below the surface uh, where the seat uh, contacts. That could have been from a, a piece of sand or something or just a hot spot, which happens over time. Now, if you have enough of those hot spot, the valve seat isn't just sealing the valve. It actually acts as a giant heat sink. It's drawing all the, all the heat out of the valve, the exhaust valve in particular. So we'll see, generally see more pitting in the exhaust valve seats than we do on the intake sides. Um, every time there's a little dot that the, it is not making contact with the valve, that's creating a hot spot because that part is not sucking the heat out of the valve. So then as, as it gets hotter and stays hotter, you'll slowly see it increase in size to where if you go long enough, that pot, that hole will be the whole width of the valve seat contact face. That's what we call the 45. So you have the 45 degree angle, which is the, at the, the surface face. Um, so there's your 45. This is normally called like a 30 and sometimes you'll even have a 15 and then after the 45 you'll have uh, like a 60, 70, 85s and even 90s, 90 being straight into the port. So we can re not only reshape the 45, but reshape the angle or the trumpet shape like a velocity stack to in potentially increase horsepower or just get life back into the seat if it's a, a heavily used or eroded uh, surface. Sometimes if we know like this is gonna be an endurance bike, so we're actually gonna probably run these seats a little wider than if it was like a sprint bike because that'll give us longer life of the valve and the contact face. It'll seal longer. Um, it'll give it longer before any of those hot spots become a, a problem area. Uh, also keeps the uh, valve lash in spec longer because it, the wider the face, the larger the contact area, the less chance of it wearing past that area uh, to where you start losing valve clearance. Um, the, the materials that they use in all these new engines are much higher grade than they used to be 20, 30 years ago. Valves, they do mushroom or, or lose valve clearance by wearing through, but not at the rate that they did a long time ago. Uh, they're also, most bikes have, especially your high-end sport bikes, have titanium valves with a special coating, which helps uh, against the wear of the valve uh, eroding away like that. Like we're gonna replace the valves just because of a known quantity of time and what the purpose of the motor is. If this was a street motor with 4,000 miles, we're gonna clean these valves, put them back in the original holes, let them run for another, you know, four to 10,000 miles with no problem.